Okay, so we'll make a start now. Hopefully other people will, will join us. Welcome to this afternoon's midwifery course information session led by Aisha Ahmed from the University of Wolverhampton. We're delighted that um, you could join us today and thank you for taking the time out of your day um, to come along to this session. My name is Paula Harrison and I am delighted to be hosting this session. I'm the coordinator of University Centre Telford. We're part of the University of Wolverhampton and we're based, for those of you who know Telford, in the Southwater building in the heart of Telford in Shropshire. We run lots of advice events and public lectures, uh, which normally take place in our centre. Um, but obviously, because of the current pandemic, we've moved everything online. Um, so hence today. Uh, before I introduce Aisha formally and hand over to her, I just wanted to explain um, that there will be an opportunity to ask questions about the course um, at the end of the lecture uh, via the Q&A button. Um, and we prefer you to use the Q&A button rather than the chat button. Um, and I can sort of manage the questions coming in. If you're using a laptop or a desktop, that button is in the middle of the screen at the bottom. And if you're using a mobile, it will be in the top right hand corner. We're also joined today by Ruth Round, um, who is from the applicant support team at our city campus in Wolverhampton. And she's joining us to deliver a presentation on student finance, which is obviously really important um, and very useful for health courses in particular. So we're delighted that Aisha is here with us today to deliver this information session on midwifery. She is a senior lecturer in midwifery at the University of Wolverhampton, having been a practicing midwife for over 20 years. So a very warm welcome to Aisha and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Paula. Well, welcome to this afternoon. And I've been fortunate enough to be asked to talk about midwifery, obviously one of my favorite subjects. So today we're talking about the course and as part of that course, I might talk about some of my experience. So I've been a midwife for over 20 years. It's uh, been an amazing uh, career. I still practice midwifery. Uh, this is a recent role for me. I've moved into education. So I do, I combine uh, both midwifery and uh, lecturing. Uh, as, uh, so positioned as a senior lecturer. So today I'll talk about the actual course and hopefully take any questions towards the end. So welcome. So the title, some of you might have noticed if you are looking into uh, UCAS and the courses that there's been um, a title change. Originally, we had Bachelor of Science in Midwifery. And as we re, uh, reviewed our course, the Midwifery course, we changed the name slightly to a Bachelor in Midwifery. And the reason for this is that Midwifery combines both the art and the science. There is an element of science that you will learn, but there's also that element of art, the art of midwifery, which is extremely important. And because they both share a degree of importance, we decided to move away from science and towards a bachelor of midwifery so we can incorporate both the art and the science with, into the course. So again, uh, when you're looking and considering at your options in UCAS, you might see a uh, Bachelor of Midwifery. This is no different uh, to the Bachelor of Science. It's exactly the same. And you qualify or, or you uh, graduate with an honours degree. So what is clinical placement? So when considering midwifery as a career option, um, the course from the outset um, is delivered with that in mind. So what does that mean? That means an element of the course is delivered and there is an academic element to that. And there is also an element to the course where you're required to undertake clinical placement. And there you develop your skills as a midwife. There's certain competencies that you have to achieve in year one, in year two, and in year three, which progress. So the clinical placement is an extremely important place. We have five trusts that we are aligned to locally, and you're able to select or, or offer two choices where you'd like to be placed. 
So you work clinically from the outset of the course, so that's from year one, alongside registered midwives and other healthcare professionals. You follow their shift pattern. And the shift patterns are extremely important because we provide a 24 hour shift pattern. And what you'll be interested to know about midwifery is that the majority of mothers go into labor at night. So midwifery is the only department that's busiest at night in terms of hospital settings. So you can really feel the buzz throughout the night shift because the majority of mothers tend to go, they tend to relax, all the stresses tend to decrease and that allows those hormones to develop and for mothers to go into labor. So just a little um, additional point there. However, what also that means is that you uh, are expected to cover the 24 hour shift pattern across the seven days. So that's Monday to Sunday, working maybe a morning shift, a long day or a night shift. So your work in all aspects of childbearing. So you need to be competent in the provision of antenatal care. So what's antenatal care? Antenatal care is the care you offer to mothers who are newly pregnant and you look after them throughout their pregnancy. You then reach what we call intrapartum care. And that's the stage where mothers go into labor. They have, they give birth or they have their baby. And then we call, we, look, we move to the postpartum or postnatal stage, which is a stage where mothers usually go up to the ward, spend some time on, some, spend some time on the ward, and then come out to the community where the community midwife, and hopefully we'll see the same midwife follow that care through. So those are the three aspects of midwifery care, and you will facilitate all three aspects. So you'll be part of those three aspects of care and hopefully develop your skills around that. You are also assessed by clinicians. So in the first year, you'll be given a set of proficiencies that you're required to meet. And again, in the second year and the third year. And the aim is that you, we, we help you develop an ability to provide safe, high quality care um, over the three years. So who else might you work with? So we talked about community midwives, specialist midwives, consultant midwives. We talked about ward midwives, research midwives, safeguarding midwives. There is a whole array of uh, specialities within midwifery itself. However, the allied health professionals, so these are health professionals that you will work alongside, could include an obstetrician, it could include an anaesthetist, okay, so if a mother's having a cesarean section for whatever reason, uh, you, you could work alongside the physiotherapist, particularly during the antenatal period. You also, the paediatrician would offer some support around neonatal care, uh, the health visitor, uh, and sometimes social workers, and uh, sometimes paramedics. So these are the group of people that often we form very close relationships with, that we work and often we share care uh, with these um, professionals. So what happens in study blocks? So we've talked about the clinical placement. We've talked about the three years, how you develop your proficiency, how you pass each year with your proficiencies moving forward, you develop your skills. Now what happens in the study block? So hopefully within when you're in study, there is an element of obviously the theory that's aligned to the practice. So we talk about the academic side and that's what we try and teach. We try and teach uh, the academic side of the course. These are also aligned to certain assessments, but we also try and as much as we can use our skills labs. We have some new skills lab which have been recently developed. And we have uh, lots of rooms and lots of equipments with some amazing um, uh, tools that we can use to help develop skills. So what this does is this helps you build the confidence, develop the skills that you then take out to clinical practice. Now, it also allows us to help you develop going through the years. OK, so in the first year, it might just be those simple things as taking a blood pressure, which is absolutely fundamental, taking a pulse, being able to feel a mother's abdomen and know where that baby is, where that baby is lying. And then later on, uh, as you can see in that second picture, it might be uh, um, resuscitating a baby. Okay, the importance of knowing what to do in an emergency because it's often time specific. That time is just as important as managing the emergency.
And obviously, we also always try and incorporate a group work within classroom uh, facilitate, facilitation, because that's important. What you will do, like uh, lecturers we do, is you start to bring in your stories from the clinical placement, which is very important, and we help develop those scenarios and apply the academic work continuously back to practice and apply practice to the theory. So this is a course plan. So what, what am I showing you? So over the three years, what you will see is some of the squares um, uh, in, in, in a light gray, gray blue color, in almost a lime color. So what that shows is at the beginning of the course, you'll spend six weeks um, at university. So S stands for study. So that's six weeks of study. Now you can imagine before you go out into clinical placement, there's an element of knowledge that you must have to include mandatory training. So that's safety training, so manual handling training, um, uh, adult resuscitation. You'll be in uniform. You can go into uh, walk into a hospital and someone can collapse. You then need to know what to do. So the first six weeks is very much a launch around what the course is. Um, it's all the essential training that's required. And it is the theory, the, uh, the, the foundation theory that you will then start to develop as you go through. You then see uh, the area where there's uh, no marking, so that light uh, green grey area, and those are the weeks that you will be out in clinical placement. Okay, so whilst you're out in clinical placement, we expect you to do full time hours and you will be rostered. So roster refers to the shift pattern that you'll be given. So you'll be given a shift pattern alongside an assessor or a supervisor, and you will then follow the shift pattern as you go out into placement. You then have H, which stands for holiday, which is something we all look forward to. R stands for a reading week. And then E is that, uh, that poignant time, it's exam week. So after exam week, we then launch uh, into the next block of study. So if you were to look at that closely, and we're happy to send this out, it'll give you an overview of what and how the years progress. So the structure of the course. The structure of the course, is 50% theory, so 50% of the course we expect you uh, to be at the university will be uh, delivering uh, teaching, whether it be in the skills labs, whether it be in the lecture theatres or in the open teaching uh, areas. So 50% of that will be theory and 50% of that will be practice. What do I mean by practice? Practice is when you go out into placement areas. And that's what's so unique about health related course courses. It's the, the amalgamation of theory and practice. And these are very much intertwined. The theory feeds into the practice and the practice feeds into theory. And as you develop through those three years, what you'll see is a development. You'll see how your practice is brought back into the classroom and how what you learn in the classroom is taken out into practice. The theory itself is delivered at Warsaw campus. And some sessions um, are delivered in the evening or on a Saturday, but that is uh, some sessions. So that might be aligned to a module. So the BMID course itself, it's a three year programme and we have specific modules running throughout the programme. So if we look at level four, level four refers to your first year and the year is usually broken down to three semesters, semester one, two and three. So in semester one, you'll see a code. So that's uh, 4MI012. And fortunately, that's my module. So that's the very first clinical skills module that you'll undertake. Uh, alongside that, you have the other modules. So all these modules will run together. Now, what you will see is that 4MI012, which is the module on top, it runs to the end of semester two. So what does that mean? That means your assessment will be at the end of semester two. Okay, so it's almost a, semester, a module that runs over two semesters. So this is a longer module. And again, we have 4MI011, that's fundamental clinical practice. That is your document associated with your clinical placement. Okay, so you have a document, you have your proficiencies, and you need to pass those proficiencies. And that is a document linked to those proficiencies. And then we have the other modules. You can see 4MI009, that's quite a short module. So that will be launched early in semester one. 
and you're expected to submit uh, by the end of semester one. And again, this is just how we've um, paced out the assessments. And again, moving into level five, we can see how we develop from fundamental to developing, and then we move into level six, you're that, then at that advanced clinical practice uh, level. So we talk about advanced professional midwifery, advanced care of the mother and baby, and advanced inquiry for midwifery practice. So looking at the course overall, it's the three years. Midwifery is uh, a course that runs over 52 weeks. So during the third semester, you are usually out in clinical placement, but not to worry, you still have a summer break. So added components. So why Wolverhampton University? So we have our module content, but through the, uh, the curriculum, we've also embedded what we refer to as golden threads. So these golden threads are additional components that uh, we've embedded within um, the, the curriculum. So the Resuscitation Council UK, okay, so again, the guidance and what they teach is embedded. We also have the NIP, which is the uh, newborn examination. Now, this was initially undertaken by paediatricians. Now, this role has slowly evolved now, and it's become the role of the midwife. And the NMC, which is the Nursing and Midwifery Council, have now suggested that this is incorporated into the curriculum. And for Wolverhampton, this, has been, this was done a very long time ago, but this is something that you can now qualify with. Often what used to happen is you'd qualify as a midwife, you then need to come back to university to then do another course that would then help you qualify within the NIPE examination or hold that um, qualification. You now have that qualification at the point of, uh, at the point of um, qualification. The UNICEF, so this is the breastfeeding baby friendly initiative. Uh, and this is something, again, we've embedded within the curriculum, extremely important, both uh, to the mother, to the family, and as midwives. So we've embedded this really from, from year one straight through to year three. So again, we, un we embedded the principles of, of the Baby Friendly Initiative. And if anyone knows about Baby Friendly Initiative, the importance and the benefits to mothers and babies. And then we have prompt. So prompt is a specific course. It's usually a course that midwives are, uh, are sponsored and then sent to, uh, to again. And this is around obstetric emergencies. So this is when an emergency occurs and action is required promptly. Okay, hence the name prompt. And this is a specific course. And what we try to do is try to do an undergraduate prompt course. So rather than your trust or the employer where you hopefully will get a job, will send, will need to send you at some point, you already qualify with this qualification. And then we have um, an element of um, alternative therapies and a lot of our, our staff members um, have interest within this area. And we're trying to embed the art around helping self well-being and self healing. So what is value added? It's an extra component within the curriculum. It's built within the curriculum. It makes you stand out to your employers when you start looking for jobs, okay? It increases your knowledge and skills, and it makes your midwifery training unique. In addition to this, um, as a midwife myself for 20 years, providing good practice, for me, we need to provide exceptional practice. So we think if we can train you to exceptional level, the chances are we'll prov you'll provide exceptional care, which is what mothers and babies deserve. Next step, moving forward. This is the journey. So applying. So this is probably the stage um, that you're at. You're considering what and where to apply. So try to get some relevant care experience. Now, given the current uh, situation and pandemic, this is probably not easy. So if you have got some experience with healthcare, that's fantastic. If you haven't, that's not to worry. Obviously, we're very aware of the current situation. Do your homework, make sure this is the right course for you. Midwifery is amazing um, and it's something that I, I truly love. However, it comes with its challenges, it comes with the shifts and it comes with the stress. Okay, so make sure you talk to midwives, um, you find out uh, about uh, what it involves. Uh, make sure you meet the entry requirements. Okay, so look uh, look up the entry requirements, see what they are, align them to your qualifications. 
and please speak to the admissions team if you have any queries regarding your qualifications. They're very helpful and they're often able to direct you to um, the appropriate person. So I'm not going to go into the entry requirements in too much detail, but the three-year route, okay, so we have two routes into midwifery. One is an undergraduate, okay, so you come into midwifery, you do a three-year course and you qualify, hopefully, as a midwife at the end and you obtain your PIN. Uh, the second route is when you're a qualified nurse, you then come on to the course and you do a, a conversion course or a, what we call a short course, which is two years, and then you're then able to qualify as a midwife. So this is for the three year course. So a minimum uh, entry requirements is three grades, uh, GCSE grades at C or level four, which must be in English, maths and science. In addition to that, OK, so it's not one or the other. In addition, you require a minimum of 112 points. Okay. And then it breaks it down into the other um, qualifications that we also accept. So that's just a very broad overview. Okay. Usually for each, um, each academic year, we have um, around um, 70 uh, places. And sometimes we have um, in excess of 500 um, applications, and that's yeah, that's a good year, but usually we have uh, in, way in, in excess of 500 applications. So just to be aware that um, your statement, your qualifications is something that will help uh, you move uh, forward. So again, we've spoken as a registered nurse, uh, the shortened course, you need to be, uh, you have completed the adult branch and have evidence of recent study within the last five years. We're also considering uh, midwifery apprenticeships, and this is to start from September 2021. Now, what are midwifery apprenticeships? So these involve your employer, so your NHS employer. So and then almost um, agreeing to undertake the midwifery apprenticeship program. You qualify with the same qualification, but the route that you take is slightly different. So this is one from an employer point of view, a trust that we're, we're working with or aligned to, who then recommend that you meet uh, the, uh, the entry criteria and put you forward to be considered for the apprenticeship program. So writing your personal statement. Okay, so when we read your personal statement, what is it that we look for? We want you to demonstrate that you understand the role of the midwife. And this is not just uh, from TV or, or what you see on social media, because often that's not an accurate description. Be, be clear why you want to be a midwife, okay, what excites you, but however, also be aware of those constraints within midwifery. Okay, yes, it's positive, but sometimes things don't always go as planned. Uh, be women and family focused, and that's extremely important, focusing around the family, the family journey, and supporting that mother through that journey. And we understand that you might not uh, be able to obtain um, uh, experience uh, because of the pandemic and because of the restrictions. However, there may be other roles that you've been in that you can then demonstrate transferable skills even if you had, um, if you're working in a non-health uh, capacity, what skills did you develop that you think are transferable? Communication, organizational, management skills. So this is something we like to read about. We like to, we like to create a picture of the person behind the statement. Make sure it's well-written and free from obvious errors. Okay, mistakes and poor structure make you look sloppy. Uh, and what makes you? We are human and we're interested in you as a person and as midwives, we're all midwives, um, all the lecturers who are on the course are all midwives, they've practiced for various years and it's just a natural instinct to want to know about you, know about the person, does a person fit uh, that model and how can we help you develop? I can sit here and talk about midwifery all day long and midwives, but this slide tells me I now need to stop talking. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Aisha. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've got a question, and I think you may have answered it in your presentation. Lillian says that she's already a student nurse um, in year two of adult nursing. 
can she switch over to midwifery on direct entry? If it's a direct entry, yes, you can uh, switch across, but you'll need to go through the usual um, application process. I am aware that you will need to withdraw from your current course before UCAS will allow you to apply for a, a different course. So it is doable, uh, but you'll need to um, apply for the three year pre-registration uh, undergraduate course. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about whether you get paid for your midwifery placement. So, as far as I'm aware, what I'm going to say is that I'm aware of um, your bursary, uh, non and I'm sure um, I think someone's going to touch on finances. However, in terms of being paid for your shifts or for placement, that doesn't, that's, uh, that's a no. Um, but hopefully you'll obtain lots of experience from um, attending uh, your placements. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and are people able to work alongside this course? It's very, very difficult to work alongside uh, this course, um, uh, and that's from student experiences, uh, purely because the shift patterns that you're allocated, um, the amount of theory and work that you've got to then um, get done and handed in, I'm told it's quite difficult to hold uh, a job alongside um, uh, the midwifery course. Okay. Thank you. And I think that would probably be the same for all health courses, wouldn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Um, okay. And um, another question. Do you have an example or an idea of how study time in university is structured? For example, how many hours is it across how many days? So for midwifery, we try to develop the, uh, the new curriculum to make it as family friendly as possible. So when you're in university, we generally um, try and fit the, um, the theory over three days. So a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday approach. And we try and fit around. So we start the sessions from 10 uh, till 12 and then again, one till three. Now, by doing this, um, what we do require is for you to do some additional work. So we'll probably set you some work to do around that subject area. So there is, there is always, so for, within a module, if there's 45 hours of taught content, with that, there will be a significant number of hours attached to the amount that you will need to then self-study to, go, to um, help you get through that module. So generally, in terms of your academic um, everyday um, theory components, it's Tuesday to Thursday, apart from skill sessions, so I run the skill sessions, uh, when we, we're in the skills labs, we like to make full use of the skills lab, so that's usually an all day um, event, so you'll be there from nine o'clock um, straight through to the end of the day, obviously with your timed breaks, however, so in the skills lab it varies slightly, but generally speaking, it's Tuesday to, to Thursday, and you have two, you'll have two modules running on one day, 10 till 12 and one till three. Obviously slightly different for clinical practice, you cover the 24 hour uh, shift pattern, which I've mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, would you just be able to repeat about joining from direct entry, please, for the student who asked the question? Yes, yeah. so different. for those who are um, planning to enter via the direct entry, so what I might just do, just flick back very slightly. So if it's uh, a direct entry, you'll require three GCSEs at grade C, uh, which is a four, um, which must be in English, maths and a science subject. And then plus 112 UCAS points. And the UCAS points are broken down into the different um, courses that you can also use um, to include the access to higher education diploma but it's very specific on where we'd want what credits. I hope that answers that question. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asking about whether we accept foreign qualifications for this course, international qualifications. Um, my understanding is um, uh, we don't. However, I think the best, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. And it's probably admissions that you could talk to with regards to that. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, someone's saying that they have no work skills. Can you use life skills as relatable skills? Yes. 
Absolutely. And that's what we want to see. We want to see you demonstrate that uniqueness about you. You have no work skills, but you're then able to, to demonstrate transferable skills. So, th so that'd be excellent. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, Louisa says that she's a mature access student. Can you explain the credits required a little more, please? OK. 18 distinction credits from a science based subject. OK, so what we require is 45 credits. OK, so these 45 credits, there are specific areas that we want credits and we want level three, including 24 merits or distinctions at level three and including 18 of those credits must be in a science based subject. So what usually happens, you'll select certain modules and we encourage you to select the anatomy and physiology or science related uh, modules. And that will then give you those 18 credits within those modules. So those are the 18 credits relating to science. So select your anatomy and physiology modules. And the 24 credits, what we ask is they're at a merit or distinction level. So 24 credits, wherever they are within uh, the access course, are at a merit or distinction uh, level. However, 18 of those must come from a science component. And I'm told you're able to select your modules. So please select the anatomy and physiology modules. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Jenna asks, are you usually placed in a local hospital? Yes, so we have five local trusts that we work um, alongside. Um, and you're able to select, uh, offer two uh, options where you'd like to be, uh, be placed. And generally uh, you uh, get your first option. Uh, we've been quite fortunate uh, with that. But it, it is local trusts around Wolverhampton, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asking how much the bursary is usually. Obviously that will be dealt with in the next presentation. Yes, please. Okay. Um, Someone doing an access course, they have level two functional skills, maths and English, would this gain me entry? No, it needs to be at a level three, not a level two. So it needs to be at level three and then a, mer a merit or distinction. The credits need to be at merit or distinction. Okay, I think she means the access course would be her, or is level three. Oh. And then she's got level two functional skills as opposed to GCSE, I'm assuming. Yes. So again, um, what you can do is you can contact the admissions team and they'll be able to discuss specifically what they'll need to do is just um, see exactly what qualifications they are and then get back to you with regards to that. OK, and um, Lillian just says, ju just to confirm, with her years of study as a student nurse, she still needs to study midwifery for three years. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Unless you're a qualified nurse, adult nurse on the register, you will need to repeat um, the three years because you're still an undergraduate. So you'll need to do the, the undergraduate course. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions for, for now. Um, just giving people a chance to post anything else. Um, a thank you from um, Jenna. Um, with the session at the moment there's nothing more so admissions is admissions at wlv.ac.uk um, if you wanted to contact um, them to ask about anything that's specific to entry requirements um, uh, and just thank you add, Paula sorry just to add on for um, anyone that's asking specific kind of admissions questions I have popped the email address for admissions in the Q&A for you so that's just lovely. Take a note of that down and it's all um, there for you. That's great. Thank you. And Louisa, um, thanking um, everybody. This has been really informative and she can't wait. So thank you. It's very nice. Um, and Lillian, with direct entry, wouldn't she start from year two? With direct entry, um, I think probably we probably need to have a conversation outside. Um, yeah. of this. It depends on credits how you've progressed. So there are several things that we need to consider before we make um, that decision. So I think that's all for now. Um, I show you around for just a little bit. You've got, I'm yeah. aware that you've got something else to go to. So if there is anything else that's course related, 
um, yeah. that comes in, we can direct those those to you. Um, and if we, um, if I just say thank you ever so much, that was thank really you. thank you, um, and lots of thank yous coming in. Um, and I'll just hand over now to Ruth Round, who's going to talk us through um, student finance, um, and she's got a presentation to deliver. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. Hello there. I'm going to leave my camera off because um, I'm having Wi-Fi issues. <laughs> so apologies for not appearing on screen, but I don't want to crash halfway through. So um, just let me set up my presentation and then I will talk through it. Um, while I'm setting this up, I can just answer a couple of those um, questions that were asked. Uh, functional skills level two uh, maths and English are classed as equivalent uh, to GCSEs, um, but you will need a science as well because um, there isn't a functional skills science. So if you've got maths and English and an access, you will also need additional level two credits in science to meet the science requirements. Um, I think that was there another admissions type one that I might know the answer to. I'm just trying to remember. <laughs> Um, there was the question about international qualifications. Oh, yes. In, um, if you're a UK resident now, but studied your schooling in another country, mm. um, then we can certainly look to see if what you've got is equivalent. So, uh, for example, that might be equivalent to the GCSEs or equivalent to the A-levels. So it's certainly worth putting an application in. Um, or contacting either the gateway or admissions um, just to check beforehand, you know, whether the qualifications are equivalent. But we certainly do look at qualifications from other countries um, if they meet the requirements. Okay, so uh, my name's Ruth Round. I work for the gateway and uh, we provide pre-entry advice and guidance. So I'm going to go through the funding for the NHS courses. Um, the fees on the presentation of a student, sorry, the figures on the presentation of students living in England. So if you are from Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, the principles are the same, but some of the figures are slightly different. So just bear that in mind. Um, so this is where we're based in the Gateway. That's our email and our phone number. So if you do have any questions, Obviously, this is a, a public space, so you might not want to put too much information in the questions here. So if you do want to get in touch with us, particularly if you want to send us copies of your overseas qualifications or whatever, um, just email us um, and put your question in and we'll do our best to answer it for you. So the main source of funding, if you're looking to come and do a midwifery degree, is from the government from Student Finance England. So that's a loan to cover the tuition fees, which is paid directly to the university and a loan for your living costs, your maintenance loan. There's also targeted grants if you've got a disability or dependence. And I will also go through the additional training grant from the NHS. So I'll go through each of those in a bit more detail as I work my way through. So um, the living cost support, the exact amount you get depends on who you live with while you're studying um, and how much the people you live with earn. So if you're living with your parents and traveling into university each day, there's a slightly lower amount. If you're moving to halls or rented accommodation, or if you're a mature student and you live in your own home, um, you get a slightly higher amount. And if you're eligible for certain benefits, broadly speaking, that's um, students who are single parents or students who have a disability and are claiming the higher rate of um, DLA or PIP, then you get a higher amount because obviously you've got greater costs. So to give you some idea how all of that works, um, if your household income, so whether that's parents or partner, if that's less than 25,000 pounds a year, then you get the maximum depending on your circumstances. If your household income's over 65,000 a year, then you get the minimum. Obviously, if it's somewhere in the middle, you get somewhere in the middle. Um, so what you'll need to do is, um, on the student finance website, there is a calculator where you can put all the information in to find out. 
but the best thing to do is to apply for the funding early so you know exactly how much you're going to get before you start so you can plan and budget so what they take into account is the income of the people you live with so if you're a younger student and you live with your parents whether that's one parent two parents parent and step parent so it's their income if you're an older student and you live with your partner um, they take into account partner's income if you're over 25 and don't live with parents or partner then you get the maximum amount because you're not assessed on anybody else's income you're what's called a single independent student so just because you haven't got anybody to take into account it doesn't mean you'll get the minimum it means you'll get the maximum and what they look at is the gross taxable income for the tax year 2019-20 given the circumstances at the moment it might be that 1920 was absolutely fine everything was going great and then since then things have gone as we all know fairly catas catastrophically wrong so um, if your income from 1920 until you start university next year decreases by more than 15 percent then you can ask for a current tax year reassessment so they can look at next year rather than last year um, so that's something to bear in mind if you are in that position when you come to apply for your funding do contact the gateway and we'll talk you through how all that works if you're currently working um, and you know you're in a full-time job and you're giving up a job to come to university they don't take the student's own income into account so they don't look at the income how much you earned before you were a student um, so you don't need to worry that they'll say oh well you used to earn thirty-five thousand a year and um, so we'll take that into account they won't they'll know that you are going to be the student, therefore it's only the income of parents or partner that they take into account. The only time they look at the student's own income is what they call unearned income. So if you've got a property that you rent out and you get an income from that, or you've got a pension um, or a trust fund or some other, other source of money other than from earnings, then they will look at that. The additional grants for students with dependents are very tightly means tested against income. So if you are a single parent, if you've got children, particularly in, if you need to put them into childcare to enable you to attend university, then you'll be able to apply for the parent learning allowance and the childcare grant. If you've got a partner that works, um, they will take partners income into account. So you may not get any or all of the allowances it does depend on how much your partner earns so again apply for the funding early to make sure that you know if particularly with childcare costs because they can be astronomically expensive make sure that you know how much you're going to get before you start the course so the disabled students allowance is for any student with a disability or specific learning need or mental health condition or, or some other um which which means they need extra support. The 25,000 is not means tested on household income. It's a test assessed according to need. So as you can imagine, very few people get the maximum amount. What you need to do is declare your disability on the UCAS form when you apply, and then the university will assess what your needs are. So if that's, um, uh, for example, if you're a, a deaf student and you need somebody to sign, that's called a non-medical helper and that the disabled students allowance contributes towards that. Um, if you need enabling software, if you have dyslexia and you need enabling software um, on the computers, all the university computers have those on already. So therefore, there's no cost associated because they're already available. Um, so some people will need help that's provided by the university other people will need specialist equipment for example and there's a cost associated with that so not everybody with a disability or a specific learning need will will need additional support um, it's all done on a very much on an individual basis so um, student finance applications normally open in february so you can't actually apply yet. If you're looking to start in September, 
then do apply for your funding as soon as possible to make sure that, as I say, it is in place and you know exactly how much you're getting. You don't need to have a definite place at university in order to apply for your funding. So you don't need to wait till you've passed your access course or your A-levels in order to apply. You just um, can put your application in for the course and the university that you want to go to. This is the uh, screen you need. You need to create an account and then log in to the student finance. Um, you can do that as many times as you like. You don't just have to um, put it all in in one go. So create your account, log in, put the information in. When you're happy with it, it's all correct, then submit it. Your parents or partner will also need to create an account and fill out their income details and link it to your account so they can assess exactly how much support you're going to get. That's the funding from the Student Finance England. I'm now going to go through the funding from the NHS. Do bear in mind that some of our courses have a foundation year, so they're four year degree with a foundation year, and you don't get the additional NHS support for the foundation year because there's no placements in the foundation year. So the additional support is in recognition of the fact that you are doing unpaid placements. So what you can apply for is a training grant of £5,000 per year, and that's not means tested. So it doesn't matter what your parents or partner earn. Um, and it's not a loan, it is a grant, so you don't have to pay it back. In addition to that, students with children can apply for a, a, an additional uh, £2,000 on top of the £5,000. And that again is for each year of the course. The website on the, on the screen is the one that you use either to look for more information or when you come to apply for your funding. This is the first year it's run. It only, it only started in September 20 and the application process for this opened in um, about August time. So you don't apply for this till later in the year. One of the reasons for that is you have to be eligible for the standard student finance in order to be eligible for the NHS funding. So you don't have to send all your evidence for eligibility again, you just send confirmation that you're getting your student finance so that you can then be eligible for the additional support from the NHS. So as I said, all of that part from the NHS grants, but the part from the Student Finance England is loans. So the April after you leave university, you will have to start repaying your students lo loans, but only if you're earning over the threshold. And that goes up each year. So at the moment, it's 26,575. In April 21, it goes up to 27, I think it's 225. But each year it goes up so that only if you're earning more than the threshold do you start making repayments. And those repayments go through the PAYE scheme if you're in normal employment in the UK. So at the end of the month, you get your pay slip and it says tax, national insurance, student loan repayments. So it disappears automatically from your salary back to the, into the government's coffers. So you don't get to the end of the month and think, do I pay my student loan or do I eat? Because you've automatically paid it with your tax. The loan is cancelled after 30 years and over 80% of students will not pay back all of their student loan. So for the vast majority of people, the loan will be cancelled and whatever you still owe will be written off. To give you an idea, so if you're earning 30,000 a year, then the government will take £25.69 a month out of your salary, regardless of how much you've borrowed. So it doesn't matter how big the loan is, each person will have borrowed a slightly different amount. The repayments are the same for anybody earning the same salary. So everybody earning 30,000 a year pays 25.69, regardless of their personal circumstances and the size of their debt. So uh, useful information on the Fees and Scholarships website. Um, Martin Lewis has a Money Saving Expert website, which has a lot of useful information for students. So if you want to do some independent research and find out a bit more about how it works, there's that one and the which.co.uk websites. They all both have a lot of information to give you more details. Um, I'm going to take questions now, but I'm going to leave, get me 
get myself back on screen so you can see me because that's better. Well, <laughs> possibly not, you haven't seen me yet. I'm wrapped up because it's very cold. So bear with me and I will stop sharing and get myself back. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, do we have any questions, Paula? Um, we do. Um, Jenna is asking, how early would you apply for the grants and where would you do this? And I think you've answered that. Yeah, on the on the .gov.uk slash student finance website. And as I say, it normally opens in February. So just keep an eye and as soon as it opens, um, get your application in as soon as possible. Okay. Brilliant. Um, somebody asking for the link to the NHS website. Uh, okay. Um, if you've got, if they've got paper and pen to hand rather than refinding the slide, um, I'll read it out. So it's www.nhsbsa.nhs.uk. Um, and then if you do slash students, you can then go to the link to training grant or the easy way is just type in NHS training grant. And if you Google that, it, it will come up, but it's on the NHS BSA website. Brilliant. Thank you, Ruth. Um, somebody very worried about leaving their job um, as they have their own house um, and just worried about um, the impact that that will have um, while starting the course. Yeah. I mean, obviously that that that's a worry, um, and it's something you've got to decide what you want to do. But if you want to email gateway at wlv.ac.uk, because I don't want the person to give me too much information here. <laughs> um, if they want to uh, email with a bit of information on, you know, are you a single person, live with parents, have children, live with partner? If so, approximately how much do they earn? Um, we can at least give you an idea of the kind of student finance you're likely to get to at least you can then sit down and, and do the sums and work out if it is going to be feasible. It doesn't replace a full time salary. I mean, student finance is not enough to do that, but it's whether it's enough to manage. Mm -hmm. The university does have a hardship fund, um, but obviously we can't guarantee that everybody is eligible for support through that. But it is prioritising people who are, um, you know, mature and have got their own homes rather than people who live with parents and are going to get fed, whatever. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, do EU and their family members still qualify for student finance after the UK has finally left the EU? The short answer to that is we don't know yet. Um, the government have said that EU students that live in their home country now will not get student finance. So if you, you know, if you're living in France and are coming over to be a student, we know that you will no longer be eligible. Um, the regulations have not been laid before Parliament yet. We are hopeful that students who have settled status and have lived in the UK for five years will retain their eligibility um, the same as as home students um, but we can't answer that def definitively because the regulations have not yet been laid before parliament but we are hopeful if you want to put an application in and if it turns out you're not eligible for funding obviously you can withdraw your application as long as you don't enroll you don't owe the university any money um, so i would recommend applying for the course and then as soon as the application for funding opens in February, apply for the funding. So you definitely know 100% are they giving you any money or not. Um, and if you're eligible for the student finance, then you become eligible for the NHS training grant as well. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, and just back to Jenna, uh, we have given Jenna the admissions um, email address, but she was asking about science and whether it's included in access obviously we don't know what sort of access course Jenna is doing um yeah I mean most students as as Aisha said choose their modules on a, on an access course so if you choose to do an access and do English psychology and sociology then you're not going to meet the science requirements 
if you do an access and you do health studies, anatomy and physiology um, and psychology, for example, then you should get enough science modules within that to meet the requirements. So it does depend on, on um, which access course you do. Um, what it actually says, I'll read out, so I've got it up here, what it actually says on the entry requirements is access to HE full award in a health related subject, minimum of 45, 24 merit or distinction. You are also required to achieve 12 credits at level two or three in a science based subject within the access or have evidence of GCSE science. So if you've got your maths and English functional skills level two and your access, including the science, but you haven't got GCSE science, you also need to do an additional 12 credits in science at level two and three on top of the 45. So you can't double count. You can't do science at level three and say that counts as my UCAS points and as my GCSE science. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Um, somebody asking about whether the session has been recorded because they missed the beginning and would like to know what they missed. So if it's, everybody is happy, the recordings do go on the um, University Centre Telford YouTube channel within about a week or so, um, and everybody can access them from there. Um, so um, the answer is yes. Um, somebody asking, when do we apply and when do people usually hear back? I'm not sure if that's finance or courses. I, I can answer that one there. Um, application should be as soon as possible. Um, as Aisha says, we get a lot of applications for uh, midwifery. So apply as soon as possible. And um, they interview in batches. So once there's enough applications, then there'll be interviews. So you should hear within two to four weeks, depending on how busy it is, whether you've been shortlisted and called for interview or not. Okay, and then student finance opens in February. Normally February, we, they don't have a, a date where it opens on that date every year. They just kind of open yeah. it when they feel like it, but it's normally late, late February. Right. That's brilliant, thank you. So that's all the questions that have been posted so far. So um, just giving people another tiny minute to post anything else. Um, Aisha is still with us um, in case you have anything specifically about the midwifery course. But if not, I think that's everything, nothing appearing at the moment. I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. Um, and for all your questions and thank Aisha and Ruth um, for their presentations, which were brilliant. Thank you. Really useful and full of very detailed information. Uh, so, um, and also to Laura for supporting in the background from the events team. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the university. If you need to contact anybody, you've got lots of email addresses. You can also um, message University Centre Telford and we can signpost you onto people. Um, we've got a Facebook page um, that we take messages on. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.